Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I wanted to open our time together with a couple of announcements. The first, as you know, Easter is just a couple of weeks away. And with this session, we have decided this year to do something a little bit different and have an Easter egg hunt for all ages right here in the sanctuary. So we can't be super vigorous, but we can be super creative in doing this. It seemed like a great way after this year of pandemic to lift all of our spirits, but also to support our local community because so many have been struggling in this year. As you know, during Lent, we have been speaking about pathways to health. And so we are encouraging you, if you are able, to think about ways you can represent that through something you can stuff in an Easter egg. So for example, if we're supporting physical health, maybe you could get a couple of free passes to the YMCA, or if we're supporting community health, you could get um, gift cards to favorite stores, favorite restaurants, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. Um, if we're supporting emotional and mental health, you could write something or draw something or knit something that is meaningful for you to stuff in these eggs. These two sections will be for adult eggs only, so don't worry, children will not be getting an adult egg and be like, what is this piece of paper? Um, this will just be for adults, and all the way over here in the empty section <laughs> will be for our kiddos, and if you want to bring some eggs for them as well, chocolates or candies or little toys, whatever you want to bring, and that should be a festive way to celebrate Easter too. I also wanted to remind you that we're inviting you to purchase Easter flowers for that service and to let Diane know names that you would like those flowers to be given in honor or in memory of to have um, posted on that day. This Wednesday on St. Patrick's Day is a session. So lucky you, all you elders, we get to celebrate St. Patty's Day together with a wonderful meeting um, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon here at the church. Most of all today, we want to keep um, in our prayers Greg and Judy. Um, the doctors are still determining the best course of action, but we know that that will involve surgery in these next couple of days. And during the pandemic, of course, it's particularly difficult um, because visitors just can't be there with him. So um, it's a really unknown time, but let us all um, pray continuously in these upcoming days Greg and Judy for their strength and courage and for wisdom and discernment for all of those who are striving to help as best they can. Are there other things for us to lift up today? I also know I do want to add to that several of you asked where he is. He is at St. Francis in Indianapolis. Are there other things to lift up? If not, then I invite us to rise with those rainbow streamers once again as we have our opening song.
Lenten journey this morning, claiming wholeness, one piece at a time. This week, this fourth Sunday of Lent, we focus on mental health. One of the special things about puzzling is that it takes time, it takes patience, it's a journey. Sometimes that journey happens alone. Sometimes that journey happens gathered around a table with loved ones. At times, puzzles are preserved with glue. Each time we see the memories and stories come to mind about the specific times when we built and constructed that puzzle together. Similarly, all of us are a compilation of many stories that shape our lives along our journeys. Some stories are good, some are not. Some only we know. Some grow through our relationships with others. Every piece of our lives contributes to who we are. In regard to our mental health, may we reflect on the many stories that have shaped each of us as we hear this morning's gift of music through our prayer. Help 
us either. Show us our capacity for compassion for others and ourselves. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another and for ourselves. As we now observe silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Imagine the warmth that surrounds you extending to those who may be next to you in close proximity. Imagine it extending beyond these walls to the neighborhood, the wider community. See it spread like the rising sun. Let it expand to all the world. Let this be our peace. Amen. If you have not already, I invite you to open your eyes. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Our gathering hymn this morning was written to reflect a specific scripture passage about Jesus freeing a man from an unclean spirit or a demon. We are not hearing this scripture today, so I want to acknowledge that while some may find it helpful to view the negative voices that sometimes come into our mind as demons, others absolutely do not. However, the overarching message about doubt, fear, and guilt clouding the soul with fright is relevant on some level for all of us. The last verse of this hymn speaks to the hope that we all desire, saying, Jesus, clear our thought and calm our feeling, still the fractured, warring soul. By the power of your healing, make us faithful, true, whole. May we hear our gathering hymn, Silence, Frenzied, Unclean Spirit.
or even shameful, forcing us to look at patterns or areas of unhealth that enter our lives for a wide range of reasons. Personally, I want to be more healthy in all areas of life, but there's also something to be said for remaining comfortable. Unfortunately, at first at least, being healthy and being comfortable don't seem to go hand in hand. Fortunately, this week is much easier. Mental health. <laughs> Honestly, I cannot imagine a topic more challenging than this. I want to do this topic the justice that it deserves, but it feels so overwhelming. There is so much stigma around mental health. So many suffer silently with personal mental health challenges or those of loved ones. As I was reminded just this week, it was common until relatively recently for people with mental health challenges to be sent to asylums, completely silenced and cut off from others. In fact, one of my first grade school field trips was to a local mental health institute that was no longer open. I remember being horrified at learning how people were treated in the not-so-distant past. No wonder it's so scary for all of us to talk about it. Perhaps this is why it is so rarely preached. I desperately don't want to say the wrong thing, but I am sure that I will. So I apologize for that. As we begin, I confess that it is only recently that I understand how huge the difference is between those who struggle with mental health challenges for a lifetime and those who struggle for a season, especially in regard to depression. I haven't always understood this. For those who haven't experienced lifelong struggle, it is easy to say, just get over it already. Particularly if we ourselves have experienced healing after a shorter experience of depression, and we feel a bit like experts. In my reflection this week, I also realized that I've often said something like, jeez, I feel depressed today. Not even thinking about how that minimizes those who truly experience depression. And not just the blues or short-term sadness, which is what I mean when I say I'm depressed. I want to be sensitive to these differences. Yet I also acknowledge that in this year of all years, everyone has undergone some level of depression, anxiety, grief, numbness. The pandemic has impacted each of us differently, but it has impacted every single one of us. I would guess that the aftermath of going through a time like this will continue to shape people for years to come. Even children who are not yet born. That's just how it is with times of great anxiety. They stay with us long after the immediate crisis is over. Considering all of this, there were so many directions to take this sermon. I feel sorry for Garrett, who had to listen to all of them. <laughs> In the end, I have decided to focus on the stigma. The stigma that if you have mental health challenges, you don't have enough faith. The stigma that comes through labels. 
the stigma that people with mental health challenges are broken. I hope that together we can find a path to healing. My biggest problem in choosing this focus is how infuriating our scripture is. It seemed completely contradictory to what I wanted to preach this morning. I desperately wanted to just throw it out and find something more appropriate. But then I felt God nagging me, saying, this is the heart of the issue. The way this passage is frequently interpreted is where a lot of the stigma originates. Avoiding this passage is the easy way out and not the path to health. You have to confront it. Yes, God said all of that to me this week. I will not share with you what I said in response to God. <laughs> So here we are with an incredibly frustrating scripture lesson. Why is it frustrating? Because it seems to justify what I view as the most harmful of all the stigmas. That if you only have enough faith, you will be healed. If you are not healed, then you must not be a very good Christian. In today's passage, two blind men say, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus responds, do you believe that I am able to do this? They reply, yes, Lord. Jesus touches their eyes and says, according to your faith, will it be done to you? Several translations conclude their sight is restored. It seems pretty simple. Have faith, and Jesus will heal you. If you're not healed, you must not have enough faith. To make matters worse, this passage has to do with blindness, for which no one has any control. Being blind has nothing to do with how faithful a person is. Fortunately, there is a more expansive perspective for Christians with mental health challenges through a phenomenal book that just came out a couple of months ago called Finding Jesus in the Storm. The author, John Swin, interviewed hundreds of people with mental health challenges to write the book, and I will be sharing several of their stories with us this morning. The first comes from a pastor with chronic depression. She addresses the harm of equating faith with healing, saying, The assessment of a Christian psychiatrist I sought help from was that I wasn't depressed. I was lonely. I just needed better social connections. She recommended a local church I might like. I had a church. I was a pastor, for goodness sake. I had God. I knew the difference between loneliness and illness. I tried another psychiatrist, this time the mother of a good friend. She knew I was a minister. In fact, she knew my church in Nashville. I began to feel comfortable. As we talked on the phone, I told her about my terrible previous experience with psychiatrists and asked that she give me a referral to one in my part of town. She told me that I didn't need a doctor. I needed Jesus. I didn't hear a word after she said this. Being blamed for a condition in which I had no control added an hour to my daily crying session. I couldn't imagine the harm she was doing to some of the most vulnerable people. The pastor continued, it would be rather unusual, although I do know that it happens, for a person with cancer to be advised by a pastor that what is needed is not chemotherapy or radiation, but simply Jesus. Thin beliefs 
can bring out the worst in Christian people. Neither of this pastor's psychiatrists listened. They assumed that they knew what was best. How easy would it be for someone to stop having faith altogether after receiving feedback like this? The stigma that comes when we tie a lack of faith to mental health challenges is wrong. We cannot remain silent when we hear it. The stigma is so pervasive that some individuals who would benefit from medication have chosen not to take it because they view it as a lack of faith. Listen to the story of a businessman who was the father of two and an elder at his church. Even shared that he avoided taking medication because he looked upon it as being forced to make a major change in his identity. He had no desire to become a chronic mental health patient. Eventually, he got to a stage where he could no longer cope with the darkness from his depression. He didn't want to become a mental patient, but he also didn't want to live within the exhausting shadow of depression. In his hesitation, a close friend called his attention to something he hadn't considered. Faith. Ethan's friend told him, you have to have faith. Ethan responded, I do. That's why I'm not taking my medication, because I do believe in God. His friend said, no. Listen, you have to have faith in the medication. You have to believe it will help you or it won't. You're going to have to trust this too. It is not idolatry. If you really believe that God is in everything, then you have to know that God is in this medicine too. His friend's words helped Ethan open his mind to the possibility that taking medicine could be an act of divine healing, not a rejection of his faith or God. Obviously, it would not be healthy to justify consuming harmful things because of the belief that God is in everything. But if we believe that God desires wholeness for all of us, then taking life-giving medicine is an act of faithfulness and not faithlessness. This is empowering. This is how faith builds up instead of tears down. In addition to faith being used in harmful ways, another huge stigma comes through labeling. At times, being labeled with a specific mental health diagnosis can be healing. It gives us a name for what a person is experiencing. It helps relieve anxiety by allowing a person to realize that he or she is not alone and that there is hope with a treatment plan. At the same time, though, having a label can be harmful because the label can keep a person stuck saying something like, I'm bipolar. It's just the way it is. It's the way it's always going to be. More recently, people have attempted to destigmatize mental health challenges by focusing on the biology, saying it's just a chemical imbalance in the brain, or it's just like any other physical illness. For years, parents were blamed for their children's mental health challenges. This was not helpful for anyone. Saying that mental health challenges are purely biological helps alleviate blame and responsibility for the parents and also for those facing the challenges. But it also causes people to feel less capable of getting better. Why? Because the person becomes totally defined by the illness. 
and when it is not only a mental health diagnosis, but also a biological diagnosis, it causes many people to feel completely powerless to getting better. Because they no longer just have an illness, they are the illness. This is why Swinton, the author of Finding Jesus in the Storm, encourages us to use the terminology mental health challenges. Challenges leave room for growth, where illnesses can leave us feeling immobilized. Sometimes, labeling leads to the stigma that people with mental health challenges are completely broken. Getting better or having an identity outside of this diagnosis is impossible. Theologically, this leaves people stuck in the tomb instead of celebrating the resurrection message of new life. A story about a college student really made this point clear for me. Alan went home with dread after a diagnosis and he told his mom, oh no mom, they're telling me that I'm a schizophrenic. His mom responded, no, you are not a schizophrenic. You have schizophrenia. That is different. Alan wrote, yes, sometimes I feel down about it. Then I remind myself of what my mom said. It doesn't define me. It's just something I have. It gives me hope that I can keep healing. This is where I find hope in Jesus' story. Jesus always helps people who seek healing to reclaim their power. Jesus doesn't want anyone to feel like a powerless <coughs> victim defined by social stigmas. Notice that the blind men in today's story say, have mercy on us, not fix our vision. The original Greek says, according to your faith, let it be done to you, and their eyes were opened. It does not say that they had recovery of sight, as several translations today record. The men ask for mercy, and their eyes opened. This could be about blindness, and it could be about so much more. How are their eyes opened? Are they now open to the fact that they are worthy? That brokenness does not define them? That they don't need a priest to tell them that they are acceptable, as was the custom. Because God made them acceptable from the very beginning. That the ability to transform, be whole, live within them the entire time. Healing comes as we claim the power that God has put within every one of us. Healing comes as we support those with mental health challenges in non-judgmental ways. Primarily by listening or speaking up when we hear negative stigmas reinforced. Healing comes by not labeling, not trying to give reasons for a person's mental health challenge, not trying to fix. Instead, leaning into the belief that God does desire the best for all of us, even in our times of most despair, even when we don't feel God's presence. It is said well through a concluding story by Karen. She writes, In the darkness of my affliction, God is silent. I remember being really low one night and telling God that if he didn't intervene, I was going to end it because I had had enough and nothing happened. 
There was no sense of intervention. And yet, actually, I guess God did intervene because I did not take my life. She later wrote, faith is no more a magical power than it is a feeling of settled trust in God, even in the continuing darkness and silence, even when we cannot see and hear. Faith is incredibly important, but not because it always leads to the physical and mental healing that we desire. It is a gift of the Spirit. It is something that the church does together. Like joy, we can hold faith for one another until the darkness passes, even if we have to carry on and prepare for the next cloud of darkness that for some will inevitably come. As Karen said, faith is not magic. It is a settled feeling that we can trust God even in the continued darkness. A very wise person said to me this week, Sometimes I tell others about my mental health diagnosis, not because I want them to say anything, but because it allows me to feel more safe in future interactions. Like I don't have to hide a part of who I am, or that I'll slip up and say something wrong. I can just be myself. It would be nice if people would just respond, thank you for sharing that with me. Instead of worrying about filling up the space with saying the right thing, this individual continued, if a person doesn't know what to say in response, I wish they felt comfortable just saying that, like, thank you for sharing that with me. I admit that I don't know what to say. This individual continued, Ironically, the more we try to say the right words, especially when we're uncomfortable, the more likely we are to say something we wish we hadn't. <clears throat> what wise words. 36 of you, 36, recently said it was important to be a non-judgmental presence in this community. So, let us be a non-judgmental congregation with expansive beliefs that support and encourage one another. There needs to be a new faith-based approach to mental health. One that starts by listening and then speaks up when hurtful, harmful things are said. With our eyes opened, I pray that we can be a part of the life-giving voice and ears that lead to mental healing for ourselves and for others. I invite you to join me in the spirit of prayer. Healing God, especially of our stigmatized fear of mental health challenges, we come before you to make our prayers known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to wholeness from the broken pieces and grief. You have stamped each one of us as worthy. We give you thanks that your mercy is wide, and your faithfulness to us does not depend upon having our feelings sorted out or our sense of well-being secure. You are not waiting for us to get our act together before offering us your love 
and grace. Help us trust that you are with us even when we feel distant from you or you feel absent. We pray especially for those who have experienced heightened and acute mental and emotional difficulties as a result of this year of isolation and fear. We pray for those who feel far from hope and we mourn at those who could not find a lifeline to survive this hardship. We pray for all who find themselves without access to adequate care, someone to talk to, to appropriate resources, to steady hearts and minds. We give thanks for those who are telling their stories, showing us how to open our hearts to help others, and offering ripples of healing in the community. We pray grateful thanks for the efforts of all who are working to destigmatize mental health challenges, making it easier to ask for and get the help so desperately needed. We ask for courage and encouragement to reevaluate how we as a church can help now and into the future. We pray this day for our own healing, for all our loved ones who are on our minds and hearts, especially for Greg and Judy as they face such uncertain times. May they sense our care and concern. May they experience your peace and love. May wisdom and discernment guide everyone as they find paths to healing. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus asked, do you believe that I am able to do this? Jesus' question invites us to consider our own belief in transformation. He invites us to step into a renewed vision of our lives, to speak into being a new story, not to be bound to the stories of the past inscribed on us by others that may be oppressing and limiting for us. I invite you then to find the puzzle piece that is labeled mental health. When you hold this piece by itself, it is one of the most dull looking of our puzzle pieces. It has no sun, no tree, no obvious rainbow. It is an eerie green color. The way many of us feel when we are struggling with depression or anxiety or our own mental health challenges. Yet, when we surround this piece with those around it, it is transformed. While still dark and ominous, now it becomes the heart of the puzzle. Surrounded by light, color, deep rootedness, and new growth of the tree. In what ways does your life feel dark and dull? Are there ways you can change your story to bring back life and light? What are the major stories of transformation in your life? Who has helped you write a new story. May we all rest for a moment with our thoughts.
Each week, we look at the reaction of the crowd to the healing story. This week, the crowd was amazed and cried out that nothing like it had ever been seen before. How interesting that the crowd is seeing something for the first time, just like the blind men's eyes are opened. How could we join in opening our eyes in new ways? What do we need to envision anew? How can we be better listeners, advocates? If our conversation around mental healing has sparked ideas for new ministries as a congregation, we invite you to include your ideas on the idea board that is in the reception hall. We also invite you to offer your financial gifts either in person or through the mail so that we can continue to support the ministry of this place. This final song is so powerful and it's assurance of God's love for all of us. So I invite you to hear it however you need to. If you would like to remain seated, please do so. If you would like to stand, please do so. If you want to wave your ribbons, please do so. But let us sit in the beauty of these comforting words.